All right. So uh, chapter six here is kind of a short little chapter. It's really about chemical equations and balancing equations. So we're going to talk about the approaches to uh, balance these equations. And then we'll jump into chapter seven, which kind of follows along with they were talking about different types of reactions, ways to classify reactions and all that good stuff. All right. So first off, how do we know sort of a, a reaction occurs uh, there's oftentimes some types of signs that we can see, visual signs, uh, some of which we've seen over some of the experiments that we've done, uh, things like color changes, uh, especially color changes, maybe that results also in some type of solid that forms, uh, bubbles that occur. Uh, bubbles is usually an indication of some type of gas has been basically created. Um, so we've done a number of them. I think that has produced hydrogen gas. Also, I think some that produce some oxygen gas. A lot of those ones we did with like the wooden splints and you blow it out or you don't blow it out and you kind of put it in as well. Uh, heat um, is also another sort of sign of a chemical change that occurred. Uh, even if you're holding onto a test tube, maybe it gets warm, uh, maybe it uh, cools down. That results in some type of energy being given off or absorbed by the reaction. Uh, clearly, a flame would be a visual sign. Um, that obviously uh, would be another important sign of a reaction taking place. Remember that chemical reactions really are chemical changes. So what we start with and what we end with are fundamentally different things. So new things have formed. So here's an example of some uh, bubbles, gas being formed. Um, <clears throat> In this case, uh, some color change that occurs. This is like an acid base titration ish uh, type of situation, and a new product is being formed there. It started to kind of pink. We added something to it, it becomes blue. Uh, this is definitely a reaction taking place, uh, some type of solid that wasn't there. As a result of mixing uh, two solutions together, uh, we'll do something very similar to this guy a little bit later on, maybe next week. I think it might be shot for. Um, <clears throat> I think we did it earlier when we made that yellow guy. I think we actually did. Uh, and obviously, our hydrogen gas here with some, um, say, calcium and water. Um, <clears throat> we saw some videos of that. And obviously, a chemical reaction taking place when you light the Bunsen burner and you do get that flame that occurs. So one way that we represent a chemical re uh, reaction occurring is through a chemical equation, and it is the representation of what is going on. In a chemical equation, we use the formulas for everybody that's involved. Um, and there are two sort of sides to a chemical equation that we'll talk about. Thank you. <clears throat> And uh, we have really our reactants, which are on our left-hand side, and we have our products, which are on our right-hand side of the arrow. So when we look at this, we could say that molecular hydrogen reacts with molecular oxygen uh, to yield water. It's important sometimes to remember a couple of things we talked about in naming and just in general about some elements. Uh, sometimes if you are given uh, kind of the reaction in words, you want to make sure that you are using the correct formulas. Uh, things like hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Remember, those are all diatomic molecules. So a very common mistake that people make when they kind of go uh, to write an equation and they say something like hydrogen uh, reacts with oxygen or hydrogen gas reacts with oxygen. They write just H and O, and that will be very problematic when you go to balance things. So you want to make sure definitely that you start with the right formulas. So a very common way that hydrogen, oxygen are sometimes referred to kind of in words is like that uh, molecular hydrogen basically means hydrogen gas. That's how it comes. Uh, molecular oxygen means oxygen gas as well. And the arrow basically represents to yield or produce water in this particular case. Now, what's wrong with the above reaction is the idea of in a chemical reaction, really the only thing that's occurring is we're bringing, pretty much breaking all the bonds on the reactant side. We're making new bonds on the product side. There is no loss of any elements along the way. So they basically just break apart. They recombine on the other side. So when we write a chemical equation, 
as we will see, it should always be balanced. And in this particular case, it's sometimes referred to as the unbalanced equation. And it's unbalanced because if we really just take a accounting of everything we got going on, there's two hydrogens on the left, there's two oxygens on the left, over here on the right, there are two hydrogens and only one oxygen. Remember that the number goes to the guy to the left, right? So the subscript there goes to the guy to the left. So we can't do that in a chemical reaction. Law of conservation of mass tells us we basically don't create nor destroy any sort of elements or mass along the way. So basically, if we started with four carbons, we should end with four carbons. You know, if we had six hydrogens, we should end with six hydrogens. Uh, they may be in different compounds or substances on the product side, but we should never, ever lose anything. So to balance this sort of reaction here, we could simply balance it by putting some coefficients. And that's what we do when we do balance an equation. Uh, so once again, here we have two hydrogens. Uh, we got two oxygens two hydrogens and only one oxygen on the right. So we can put a two in front of the H2O. That then gives us this two does get distributed to everybody behind it. Uh, so that means we now have four hydrogens and now two oxygens. This, as you will probably know, or probably see, that's a very common sort of situation. We oftentimes can fix one thing, but pretty much we'll screw up something else in the equation as you go through balancing it. So that means we would need to completely balance it by putting another two in front of the H2 on the left-hand side. That two there will give us two times two, which is four hydrogen. So by changing those coefficients, uh, we now have a balanced equation. And pretty much that is always the first thing that you should always look at when you are using anything that involves an equation. So if you're just balancing equations, you definitely should look and make sure it's balanced. If you're doing something like we'll talk about later on, something like stoichiometry or something else that involves using the equation, you should always take a peek at it and make sure that it's balanced. There's pretty much no situation in chemistry where you would use really an unbalanced equation. So, and a lot of times, if you do see coefficients, you know, you probably could be fairly confident that it is balanced, uh, but you should always definitely double check it. You should always double check it, especially if you do not see any coefficients in the equation, for sure, take a good look at it. But, you know, you should always make sure that it is. So some of the important parts of our uh, reaction here, our equation, again, on the left-hand side, these guys here would be considered our reactants. And that is the starting material in a chemical reaction. Um, and it's always found, again, on the left-hand side of the arrow. On the right-hand side of the arrow, this is what is referred to as our products. And that is obviously what is being produced as a result of this chemical reaction taking place. So it's always reactants to products, starting material to obviously ending material here um, as to what is being produced. When we look at a balanced equation, and we'll talk more about this in a later chapter, but when we look at a balanced equation, we can look at those coefficients and they do represent some different sort of uh, ways of looking at the equation. We could say, for example, here that there are two molecules of H2 react with one molecule of O2 to form two molecules of H2O. And those numbers that I'm referring to are really the coefficients from the balanced equation. It gives us sort of a relationship of how everybody's reacting in this particular uh, equation. The relationship that we'll use the most in a later chapter is what's sometimes referred to as the mole to mole relationship. And that also uses really the coefficients in the balanced equation and they represent the moles of each of those substances. So we could say from the balanced equation, there are two moles of H2, one mole of O2, and two moles of H2O. <clears throat> the bottom relationship is sort of what we were just talking about, law of conservation of mass, because basically we started with four hydrogens on the left and two oxygens on the left, and we ended with four hydrogens on the right and two oxygens on the right. Each hydrogen is basically one gram, each oxygen is 16 grams. So you basically have 36 grams of reactants, should give us in terms of the molar mass, 36 grams of products. Again, because we should not lose any elements along the way in this particular reaction. 
Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Other kind of information that we very commonly will see in reactions uh, are really the states of each of the substances. Uh, so we'll see G, L, and S. And again, G, L, and S stands for gas, liquid, and solid. And those are oftentimes written next to formulas in the chemical equation. Another really common one is the AQ symbol, which is aqueous. And aqueous is really a solution. So it's usually made by taking something and dissolving it in uh, a solvent like water. So if you took some solid sodium chloride, again, and you dissolved it in water, that would give you a sodium chloride solution that would have the aqueous symbol. Something that has the L symbol that's a liquid is a pure liquid by itself. So something if you just had water by itself, and it's in the liquid phase, would get the L. But again, if you took water and you took some sodium chloride, that's a solid, the solid would dissolve and you would end up with a sodium chloride solution that would get the aqueous symbol. So again, there is a difference between AQ and L. <clears throat> uh, one's a solution, one's not. I would say in most cases, we do write chemical equations to represent uh, chemical changes and chemical reactions that are occurring. We could also write chemical equations to represent physical processes that are happening that are technically not chemical changes. And that's what we see down here. This is basically liquid water freezing. So that's the process of freezing. We could still write an equation for it, basically just going from liquid to solid water, which is ice. And that is obviously a physical change. So we can write an equation for a physical change. Same thing here, if we took liquid water and we basically heated it, we would get water vapor or steam, which is water, the gas phase, also a physical change. So a vast majority of equations that you see will involve a chemical change, but we could still use equations to represent physical changes that are occurring as well. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Another common thing here is kind of what I just described there, making something like a sodium chloride solution. We sometimes could also write equations to show uh, the making of something like a solution or dissolve in water. So sometimes water would be written over the arrow, uh, which would indicate that you're dissolving something in water. And again, you get that aqueous sort of uh, state that occurs. Other things that are sometimes written on top of the arrow, sometimes people will use a delta symbol to represent heat is being applied. Uh, sometimes people will write on top of an arrow a catalyst. A catalyst is uh, not a reactant. It's uh, not a product. And it does not get used up. in the reaction. It is there in most cases to uh, make the reaction occur faster. So it's really there a lot of times to speed up the reaction. So a lot of times you'll see on top of arrows for catalysts, they'll actually won't just write catalyst, but they'll write something maybe like platinum, that's a metal that's being used. Uh, they'll sometimes write H plus, which represents an acid being used as a catalyst. So a lot of times you'll see some of those things written on top of the arrow. And again, they're really not reactions or products, but they are there to sort of facilitate the reaction uh, sort of occurring. <clears throat> so let's talk about the steps to balancing an equation. And really, you know, there's a few different approaches that people take, but I would say probably most people take the trial and error sort of approach, which is uh, you kind of put a coefficient in front of something and then put another coefficient and hope everything sort of balances out. A lot of times going with what seems to be the easiest thing to balance first is sometimes the best route. Uh, if you have elements in uh, multiple things on one side and one thing on the other side, kind of leave those guys to the end. So just kind of take it a step by step. A couple of important sort of steps, obviously, is if you are given... Uh, the reaction in words, you want to write the formulas for everybody, the reactants and the products out 
correctly first. So just like you were doing nomenclature, you want to write the proper formulas. A lot of times what people try to do when they are given uh, reactions in words or they're just given the reactant part and they got to kind of predict what's on the product side is that they try to write formulas and balance at the same time. And you should never, ever do that. So the order that you should always follow is if you need to provide the formulas yourself and they're not provided for you, you should get all the proper formulas down, just like you were doing naming, just like you're writing formulas, regardless of balancing. Once you have all the correct formulas down, then you should go back and balance them. So again, try not to do it at the same time. That's when people get wrong formulas, things that don't balance correctly. Once you have all the proper formulas written, that's your unbalanced equation, or if it's given to you already, all the formulas, that's your unbalanced equation. The next thing that you wanna do is to begin balancing it. Again, here, this approach is to start with the most complicated. Person I start with what seems to be the easiest to balance is, is usually a good idea. The most important thing is the only thing that we could do to balance an equation is change the coefficients. So that's the numbers that come in front of all the formulas. We never ever change the subscripts. So for example, like the one we had earlier, we had H2 plus O2, a little H2O. So when we went to balance this equation, when you balance any equation, it is only the numbers in front that you should change. You should never change any other number and that is because if I change the two here, for example, what did I just do for water? I just made it not water. Yeah, so we never change any of the subscripts. Otherwise, obviously, you change what it is, and then they have a bunch of other issues. The other thing that you don't want to do is put big numbers in between a formula, like in between the H2 and O, lay a like, big two in front of it, or the oxygen or anything like that. Uh, so... Sometimes people think they can balance equations by just like inserting a big number in front of one of the letters there in the formula. You don't want to do any of those type of things either. So you want to balance equation, uh, balance the coefficients. Again, what's going to probably happen is as you balance one thing, you're going to mess up something else. So you need to go and go back and forth usually. And eventually everything should fall into place. Oftentimes very helpful is to make a little table and kind of keep track of everything that you're balancing it. Um, so it kind of also gives you an idea where you might want to start as well instead of just kind of jumping in. When you have a properly balanced equation, there's really kind of two main things that you have to have. And that is all the coefficients need to be whole numbers. So when you feel like you got the equation all balanced, so we'll just pretend this one's balanced. All the coefficients in front do have to be whole numbers. And they also have to be the simplest set of whole numbers. So for example, although this equation may be balanced in my example here on the left, I could go through all those coefficients and divide by two, which is what I would want to do and reduce it down to the simplest whole numbers. And that would give me the properly balanced equation in this example. So sometimes people could see maybe larger numbers to balance an equation, and it may be balanced in terms of how many you have on both sides. But if you could reduce down all the coefficients and still have whole numbers, um, you need to do that to have the properly balanced equation. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> All right, another approach here. Again, I'll put it up here in case you want to look at, but let's just take a look at some examples here. All right. All right, so let's take a look at one here. So personally, if we were to balance this equation here, this is what I would kind of approach it. So the first thing that I would do is make a table pretty much of all the elements that are there. So in this case, we have a reactant side, we have a product side, and we have nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. So to kind of take toll of what we got going on here on the left-hand side in terms of nitrogen, we have one. Right-hand side, we have two. Left-hand side for oxygen, we have one there. Right-hand side, we have one. 
And left-hand side, we have two hydrogens there. And right-hand side, we also have two hydrogens there. So looking at our table here, we can see that pretty much everybody is good except for the nitrogen. So obviously that would be a really good place to start. So again, to fix it, we're going to put a coefficient in front. So we're going to lay us up a two right there. Now that two will give me two nitrogens in terms of oxygen. That two again gets distributed to everybody behind it. And that would give me two oxygens and still two hydrogens, which come from right here. All right, so very common, as I mentioned, we fix one thing, but kind of messed up something else. And that's okay because we could easily balance the oxygen on the right-hand side now by going to there and putting a two in front of the oxygen, which would go here. At this point, we still have two nitrogens from here. This two once again gets distributed to everybody behind it. So that's gonna give us uh, two oxygens and now four hydrogens. So we fixed the oxygens, uh, we got our nitrogens good. The last thing that we need to do now is fix the hydrogen. So we're gonna go to the left-hand side and to fix the hydrogen on the left, uh, we're gonna put a two there as well. That's gonna give me uh, two for the nitrogen, still two for the oxygen. And once again, this two gets distributed and multiplied by that two, uh, which gives us four uh, hydrogen in this case. And this would represent the properly balanced equation. <clears throat> Any questions on that one there? <clears throat> All right, so why don't you try one here? That's the one we just did, I think. Yep. All right, so why don't you balance this equation and see what you come up with here? Okay, let's take a look. Uh, so again, I'm just gonna make a table. So I got reactant side, got product side. Again, here I got carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen going on. Uh, Left-hand side there, we have uh, three carbons. Right-hand side, we have one. Uh, eight hydrogens there and two there. Oxygen on the left, we have two. Oxygen on the right, we actually have three to start with, right? So we got two there and one more there gives us three total. So again, even though they're different things, you don't want to miss any of those. At this point, it would probably be the simplest thing to start with would be the carbon. And we could put a three on the right-hand side here to fix that. When we do, that's going to give us three for the carbon. A reminder that this guy goes again for both of the guys behind it. Uh, we still have two hydrogens. Now, in terms of oxygen, we have six in the first one. And we still have the one in the water there, which gives us seven, if I'm doing the math there right. The next easiest thing to solve would probably be the hydrogen in this case. The oxygen, probably not the place you want to go because we do have oxygen in a couple places on the right and only one place on the left. So it's in a lot of different places. So we might as well just batten down the hydrogen here. And we could do that by putting a four in front of the water. That again gives us three carbons. Uh, for our hydrogens, four times two is eight. And once again, this four also gets distributed to the guy on the back end there. So that's going to give us six in the first guy uh, in the CO2. And then four more for the oxygens in the water on the right. And that's going to give me 10 if I counted that up correctly. At this point, the simplest thing to do would be to come here to the left-hand side and put a five in front of the O2. That's going to give me uh, three carbons, eight hydrogens, and once again, five times two. That is a coefficient. It got a little high there when I wrote it, but there it is. It is 10 uh, in terms of the oxygen. Any questions on any of those? <clears throat> All right, let's try a few more here. Make sure. All right, so we got this one. Di boron trioxide reacts with boric acid to form boric. I'm sorry, we react with water uh, to form boric acid. Again, in this case, if you were given just the words like this, 
you don't want to worry about the balancing part. First, you want to make sure that you do something like this and get the correct formulas down first. So diboron trioxide would be B2O3. It's a non-metal, non-metal. Uh, water would be H2O and boric acid. There would be BOH3. Now that you have the correct formulas, now you want to change the coefficients and make sure it's balanced. So take a moment and see what you come up with. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, so again, if we make our little table here, um, we got two borons on the left and we have one on the right. We have uh, three oxygens there plus one more there gives us four total oxygens. On the uh, right-hand side here, this three does get distributed into both of the guys inside the parentheses. So that's going to give me uh, three oxygens. On the left-hand side, I have two hydrogens. And once again, distributing that three in uh, will give me three for the hydrogens there on the right-hand side. Not much to work with here. So obviously, right-hand side is probably a good place. And to fix the boron there, uh, we will put a two in front of it. When we do that, that's going to give us two borons. Now, this two does get distributed also to everybody behind it. So that would get us in terms of the oxygen. Three times one is three times the two in front is six. And for the hydrogens, three times one is three plus times the two in front is six. So we do have six on each of those. So if you have a parentheses, you have to distribute to the subscript to the parentheses. And if you put a coefficient in front, it also gets distributed to everybody behind it. Uh, at that point, um, we should go to the left-hand side. Once again here, the hydrogen is probably the easier thing to fix because it's just in one thing on the left-hand side. And if we fix the hydrogen, we would put a three here in front of it. That's going to give us two borons. Now, in terms of oxygen, that is a three there. This three gets distributed once again to everybody behind it. So that also gives me three and three, which is six for the oxygen. And three times two is six for the hydrogen. So by fixing the hydrogen in this case, it also fixed the oxygen, which again, at some point is very common that happens. Kind of everything sort of should fall into place in terms of the numbers. Any questions on that particular one there? <clears throat> Okay. Take a look at another one here. That was a quick look. Let's click a little longer. All right, let's balance this one up, see what you got. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, so again, we'll do our same approach here. We'll do uh, nitrogen there on the left is one. On the right is one. Hydrogen on the left, we got three. And on the right-hand side, we have two. Oxygen on the left, we have two. And once again here, oxygen on the right, uh, we have two, it looks like. So everything is balanced except for the hydrogen in this case. So we have three on one side and two on the other side. So really, if you just multiply those numbers together, that's six. So that's the kind of the number we're going to shoot for for hydrogen. In this case, we actually have to put numbers on both sides to do that. Uh, we would need a three here, and we would need a two there for the six for the hydrogen on both sides. That is going to give us on the left-hand side now two nitrogens. Uh, it will also give us, again, six hydrogens as this guy once again gets distributed. On um, We have two oxygens still. Right-hand side, we have one nitrogen. Uh, in terms of hydrogen, once again, distributing this guy will give us six. And in terms of the oxygen, we do have uh, one in the first and three there in the second. And that is four, if I did the math right there. So here we fixed the hydrogen, but pretty much messed up everything else. So again, the next easiest thing probably to balance is nitrogen is kind of one thing on both sides uh, would be the nitrogen. So we'll put a two here. And when we do that, that gives us two nitrogens. Once again, this guy getting distributed to everybody behind it. And for the hydrogen, we still have six. Now in terms of oxygen, we do have uh, two here in the first guy, and we have three in the second, and that is gonna now give us five, yeah. At this point, we have numbers everywhere. We pretty much only have one opening, which is the O2 there on the left-hand side. Uh, we basically need to turn that two into a five. We don't want to start changing other numbers because then, you know, it might be a long day, right? 
So in this particular case, uh, to turn a two into a five, we could use something like a fraction, which would be say five divided by two. If we use five divided by two in this case, uh, we will end up with uh, two nitrogens, six hydrogens, and when you take five halves times two, the twos cancel and you're left with five, which would give us five for the oxygen. This equation is balanced, but is it okay to leave it like that? It is not because all the coefficients do have to be whole numbers. So uh, this illustrates a good point. You can use a fraction to balance an equation, but if you use a fraction, you then need to clear the fraction. So to clear the fraction, we need to multiply everybody by the denominator, right? So everybody, not just the fraction, but everybody in the equation in this case needs to be multiplied by the denominator there, which is a two. Uh, that's going to give us four NH3 plus 5O2 gives us 4NO plus 6H2O. And if we did everything correctly here, we should still be balanced. So we have four nitrogens on the left. We have four on the right. We have 12 hydrogens on the left. And six times two is 12 on the right. Oxygens, five times two is 10. We have four in the first guy, six in the second guy. That gives us 10. So we are balanced. So in certain situations, you may need to, or maybe the easiest thing to do is to use a fraction. How to choose the correct fraction is pretty simple. If you're going to choose a fraction, the number on top is the number you need. So for example, if you remember, we needed uh, five there so that we went with five up on top. The bottom number should usually match the subscript which is a two. So these guys should match. Number up on top is the number you need. And you'll usually pick the right fraction in each case. Now, if you can see the bigger numbers to balance this without the fraction, you absolutely could do that. Again, just make sure you can't reduce it down any further and still have whole numbers. <clears throat> Question on that one there. <clears throat> All right, so let's try a few more here just to make sure. All right, so why don't you try these and let's see, let me add one more too. Let me add, uh, do uh, C2H6 plus O2, well, CO2 plus water. All right, take a few minutes here, balance each of these up. Okay, let's take a look, see how you're doing. So um, it was a good question that was asked, you know, sh maybe should you break it up or not break it up? So when you look at an equation and if you do see something like this, which is basically those polyatomic ions, and they are kind of the same on both sides, you could break it apart, uh, but you do have a lot more distributing you got to do of the sort of the numbers and all that kind of stuff. A lot of times it's a lot easier to keep those guys together and really just sort of balance them as kind of units. So for example, that's probably in the top one here where you would wanna start. We would see that we have uh, three of the sulfates there on the left. We have only one on the right. So to balance the sulfate, you could just put a three in front of it. That gives us our three sulfates that we need. But when you do this approach, pretty much what you uh, would wanna do is follow what else is in there. So it gave us three sulfates, but it also then gave us three calciums, and that's where you would want to go next. So you would go to the left-hand side, and we see we have only one calcium. So to fix that, we would put a three in front of the calcium. That would fix the calcium. And now where you should go next is to the CL, which is the other thing that's in there. That would give us six of the CLs. To fix that, we would then go over here and put a two in front of it, giving us six of the CLs on both sides. And then we would go to the iron, which we're good at that point because we have two irons. So it's a lot easier uh, when you do have equations that have polyatomic ions in it to keep them together. 
and really balance them as whole units. You could still go again, element by element, but there's a lot more kind of multiplying in, multiplying out, because usually when we have more than one polyatomic ion, uh, you do need to uh, put parentheses and that number on the bottom. Question on that approach, yeah. They, they will not separate. They're, so remember they're uh, together in terms of sharing electrons. So, uh, you know, they're all sharing electrons. They just have a charge. Uh, and again, obviously you would need a polyatomic ion the same on both sides. So you need it, you know, sulfate and sulfate on both sides. Can't just have it on one, obviously, and do this approach. Other questions? There? <clears throat> so here, if we look at the second one, also has uh, a couple different polyatomic ions. It's got NO3 and NO3. It's also got some phosphate and phosphate basically happening here. So again, here, I would pretty much start with a polyatomic ion. You could choose either one. One will work better than the other. So for example, if you chose the nitrate, you would go with a two here. And when you would do the two for the nitrate, you would then go to the copper and do a two. The problem though is we now have six coppers on the left and two on the right here. So we know that our first two on the right was not correct. So you might need to reset it if you chose that one first and come back here and go, all right, well, that doesn't look right. So we need to actually make this a matching six in this case to do that. And that would give us six coppers, which now does match, gives us six nitrates, which if we come over here, we need a three and now we are balanced. So even if you kind of chose the wrong one first, you just have to make a little correction and you will get back to balance. Now, if you chose the other one, obviously first in this case, which would be the phosphate, you would not run into trouble. So we have that. And copper there. So if you went with the phosphate first, you would have put the two there, then saw that you should go to six here and then make our nitrate six. So again, one would have worked a little bit more smoothly than the other, but they both would work. But you got to just make sure you do obviously have it balanced on uh, either side. So I would highly recommend, again, if you have anything where you do have these polyatomic ions, uh, that you uh, kind of keep them together and balance them that way it would be a good approach question on either of those two there. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let me do this one on a different page. C2H6, I think. So we had uh, C2H6 plus O2, CO2 plus water. All right, uh, so here we'll make our table. Uh, we got our reactant side, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, product side. Left-hand side, we have two carbons. Right-hand side, we have one. Left-hand side, we have six hydrogens. Right-hand side, we have two. Left-hand side, two oxygens. And right-hand side, once again, we have two there and one more there uh, gives us three in this case. All right, so uh, I'm gonna start with the carbon again. Seems pretty simple to balance. We're gonna put a two there. That's going to give us two carbons. Once again, it's going to distribute to both of them. So that would give us uh, still two hydrogens. In terms of oxygen, we would have four there in the first one and one more there, which would make five in this case. Uh, next easiest thing would be hydrogen. And to fix that, we would put a three in front of the water. That again, going to distribute to everybody behind it. So that's going to give us still two carbons. Our hydrogens is going to be six. And now in terms of oxygen, once again, we got four here in the first one. Now we have three more, uh, which gets us to seven in this case. So again, in this case, this is a good place where perhaps a fraction would be a good thing to use. So if we we're going to use our fraction here, again, the top number would be the number we need, which is seven in this case the bottom number should match that number, which would be two in this case. 
And if we do that, that's going to give us two carbons, gonna give us six hydrogens. And once again, when you take seven halves times two, those will cancel and give you seven, uh, which would give us seven. So again, here we do have a balanced equation, uh, but we do need to clear the fraction. We cannot leave it as a fraction. Decimal point, again, has to be whole numbers, those coefficients. So we're going to take, again, the entire equation here, multiply it by two, and that would get us uh, two of the C2H6 plus 7O2 or CO2 plus uh, 6H2O. And at this point, once again here, we should still be balanced. Uh, we have four carbons on the left, also four on the right. We got uh, 12 hydrogens on the left, and we got six times two here is 12. We got uh, 14 oxygens on the left. We have four times two in the first guy, which is eight, plus six times one is six. So that's a lot of math there, but I'm hoping that's still 14. And we should still be good, I hope, at that point. Yeah. Question on how to balance equations here. <clears throat> okay. All right, then that really wraps up chapter six. We're going to roll a little bit into seven here. Okay, uh, this is chapter seven, and we're going to actually start towards the bottom chapter seven notes and then come backwards. So these are on your notes, just towards the uh, back part of the notes, and then we'll come to the front part on Wednesday. So we're going to talk about types of reactions and ways to classify reactions. And there's really three reasons why any reaction pretty much occurs. Uh, the three reasons why any reaction occurs is the formation of a solid, uh, the formation of water, and a solid, again, sometimes referred to as a precipitate. And the third reason is an electron transfer. So pretty much uh, you can boil down any reaction that you see, uh, pretty much one of those three things are happening. Here you made a solid, uh, you made water, or you have some type of electron transfer that's occurring. So really all classifications of reactions fall under really two types of categories. There's kind of two big umbrellas of categories of reactions. One is double displacement reactions. And in a double displacement reaction, you basically have two ionic compounds. And basically the positive guys switch partners and they make two ionic compounds on the back end here. And double displacement accounts for either making a precipitate or water. So that accounts for two of the three reasons why a reaction takes place. Pretty much either that's gonna result in a solid being made or that will result in water basically being made. The other big umbrella of classification is what is referred to as redox reactions. And redox reactions are oxidation and reduction reactions, like it says here on the screen. And basically that accounts for electron transfers. So as we'll talk about in this chapter, you could take the same reaction and you could kind of classify it many different ways, depending on what you're looking at. So, uh, you know, you could have one reaction that could technically be classified in multiple ways, but ultimately all classification reactions fall under one of these two sort of big categories. Either you had a double displacement happening or you have a redox reaction basically taking place. So what does oxidation and reduction mean? So oxidation means that someone has basically lost electrons. Reduction means that basically somebody has gained electrons. So sometimes people remember this through two ways. Leo the lion goes grr. Loss of electrons, oxidation, gaining of electrons, reduction. Some people are fond of the oil rig. Oxidizing is losing, reducing is gaining. You could choose them together, however you want to do it. 
put Leo the lion on the oil rig and he'll go grr, so you don't have to choose if you don't want to. But oxidation, uh, somebody loses electrons and reduction, somebody gains electrons. So how do you know sort of what is being oxidized or what is being reduced? We look at what is sometimes referred to as really the oxidation state. You could kind of think of it like the charge. It's not necessarily the exact same thing. But we look at each element or some elements and the sort of oxidation state it starts with in the reactant side to the oxidation state it ends with on the product side. Now, we could use actually a really simple number line to help us understand that. Positive numbers there are to the right of zero, right? Negative numbers are to the left. And when somebody loses electrons, do they become more positive or more negative? They do become more positive, right? Because they have less electrons, more protons. So if you look at some element on the left-hand side of the equation to the right-hand side of the equation, and you see its oxidation state or sort of charge is kind of moving in that direction on the number line, it is going through oxidation. And if somebody gains electrons, they typically become more negative because frankly, they have more electrons. So as they gain more electrons, they become more negative. So if you look at the charge of somebody or oxidation state, and it's kind of moving in this direction, it is going through reduction, becoming more negative. So for example, so if I had something say like sodium and chlorine, Makes a little sodium chloride, right? So we'll balance it up here, all that good stuff. So when we look at this here and we make our little number line, zero plus a negative. On the left-hand side, that is sodium by itself. Does sodium by itself have a charge? The answer is no. No element by itself has a charge. So if it's any element that's by itself uncombined, it doesn't have a charge. They only get charges when like metals and non-metals come together basically, right? So when things come together, that's when things sort of get charges or oxidation states. So if we look at sort of the oxidation state of the sodium here, it is zero. If we look at the oxidation state of the chlorine, that is also how it naturally comes. It comes as a diatomic molecule and it would be zero. Now, when the sodium and the chlorine get together, sodium now has what type of charge? Plus one as it's group number one. Chlorine has a minus one charge. So when we look at the sodium from left to right, sodium started at zero. On the right-hand side, ended at plus one, which is moving in this direction. Does that mean the sodium was oxidized or reduced? It was oxidized. It's becoming more positive. So the sodium here was oxidized. And if we look at the chlorine, chlorine started at zero ended at minus one, which means it is moving in that direction, right? Becoming more negative. And because it's becoming more negative, that means that it is going through reduction or being reduced, right? So you can use a really basic sort of number line and see which way it's going and it'll allow you to figure out what is being oxidized, what is being reduced. The really good news about oxidation and reduction, as we'll talk about, is they always happen together. So if somebody's being oxidized, somebody else has to be reduced. And the good news about that is if you could just figure out which one one of them is, by default, the other guy is doing the opposite thing. So that's a really good thing about that. A lot of reactions, especially some of the ones we're going to do here in lab in just a sec, uh, do sort of fall under the big umbrella of redox reactions. And there's more specific ways that you could classify these reactions. And obviously, we will continue on next time. Yeah. All right.